Mihir, what are the challenges do you think Indian companies, you were talking about Sachin Tendulkar as a global businessman, right? He doesn't face much of a problem in terms of establishing his brand. But when Indian companies go overseas, presumably they face several challenges in terms of, especially in terms of creating an image and a brand for themselves. What do you think those major challenges are? How does it play out in the United Kingdom? What have you been thinking about in terms of their, the next stage of growth for Indian multinationals? Well, I think the Indian company's challenge is in India rather than abroad. Mm -hmm. uh, because, as Anish said, India's image has changed. Let us uh, recall history, since we've been talking about history. India was not expected to survive in '47. Everybody said India will fall. Pakistan was the great country. And this country's leaders were very pro-Muslim. It's very hard to believe that. Um, but it'll be interesting for you to know, and I'm sure most of you know, that Winston Churchill came back from Yalta and told his secretary that the Hindus are the second worst people in the world. And he wished that they are only saved from doom because of their breeding. And he wished that um, a bomber Harris had enough reserve bombers to bomb them to Smithine. Now, this is Winston Churchill, a great man, of course, um, but this, is, this was his opinion. India survived for various reasons, uh, maybe because of the Hindu rate of growth and so on. And it's interesting, somebody mentioned um, License Permit Raj. I grew up under License Permit Raj. You had to have a Form P from the Reserve Bank to travel abroad, and you got the magnificent sum of two pounds when you traveled. And the joke was that was enough to pay for a glass of whiskey on the Air India flight. You certainly needed a glass of whiskey if you flew Air India those days. But anyway, um, um, the, the point is, it, to a certain extent, and, and J.R.D. Tata was himself part of the Bombay Plan, what was called the Bombay Plan, where um, the government plays a role. And let's face it, any industrialization, the government's played a huge role. The American government played a huge role in the opening up of the American economy, um, taking up land and so on and so forth. I think what has happened, the image of India has changed completely, and that is an evident fact. Also, Tatars have been the great spearhead because Tatars in India were a different sort of company. You see, um, Anish, you mentioned Tatars and Birlas. What is often forgotten is that the Birlas financed Mahatma Gandhi. Mahatma Gandhi, of course, was a great saint before Mandela came in. Um, but um, um, and Mahatma Gandhi always traveled third class. And the joke was that it cost so much money to travel third class. It was more than traveling first class. But you know, the money came from the Birlas. The Tatars never actually financed. Any, 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 any political group. And this is where I think the Tatars have used their enterprise. When they go abroad, one of the problems that Indian companies face is how do they cope with changing political scenes? Look at what's happened in Maldives with GMR, where the contract has been uh, abrogated, there was change in government, and you see in India, and of course, all Indian businessmen are absolutely 100% honest. Nobody's ever thought of corruption in India. Uh, let's, let me preface that statement. But nevertheless, they know how to manipulate the, the system, the regional governments, the state governments, and so on. When they go abroad, probably they're not that successful. The Tatars are much, because they've always been, the Tatars were always a, a much broader company. Jiadi Tata himself, I remember talking to him, said, you know, um, he, he felt painful living in India and seeing the poverty in India and things like that, and he was a very radically different man to most of the Indian business leaders. And the other problem with Indian business houses is they're family-owned business houses. So how do they divest as the families die off? I mean, this is the classic story. Nobody in India now talks of the Birlas. When I was growing up, uh, the two figures were Tatas and Birlas. And if you spend too much money, they said, well, who do you think you are, a Tata or a Birla? But nowadays, the Birla name is completely gone in that sense. And of course, the Indians are always innovators, and this will always, I think, and also, you talked about Indian businessmen, but Indian businessmen have been operating abroad for a long time. There were Indian businessmen operating in Burma. In fact, that caused enormous problems pre-war between the Burmese. If you like, the, you know, the, the, the old story, the, now the Europeans don't much talk about it, how the, the white man went out to Africa and civilized, you know, and taught everybody to cover drive. Though not many Africans know how to cover drive, but that's a different story. Uh, they taught the Indians to cover drive. So, you know, obviously, Sachin Tendulkar can cover drive. Uh, I think one can say that. But, you know, but in the wake of white businesses going out, in the wake of that, the Indian businesses went out. You know, it was the Indian businesses going out in the small villages of Africa and opening up. So there was, if you like, not multinational, right. but small businesses going out in various parts of the world. And, you know, things like Hawala, the old banking system that operated, though the, the Americans now consider Hawala to be financing the 
the jihadis, the Americans were surprised to discover Hawala. But you know, all this has been going on. Indian business houses are building on that, but they have their problems coming back, if you like, historical problems of India and how they operated. Right. Now you're the CEO for major stock exchange in India. Uh, do you ever think about taking the exchange global? What are the challenges you face? Is that part of your ambition set, or is it something, as Mihir said, no, you're just very focused locally? In a sense, our companies are taking us global. Mm -hmm. I mean, Tata's are primarily listed on us, or although he thinks Birla's have kind of gone out, but they are pretty large. They're still there, Ambani. So they take us abroad. We are the primary exchange for them. Mm -hmm. And we also have basically many, uh, like Standard Chartered recently listed on us. Uh, primarily because they wanted to become popular in India, not because they needed funds. But if you are locally listed, uh, you kind of uh, become that much more attractive. Now, the issue with India is it's net capital importing country. Right. Uh, and that's where, uh, why an exchange uh, a mechanism becomes more important to outsiders, is that when it's able to raise funds for people outside, the industry, industry list outside, while as my own demand for the companies within India is so large that we are kind of able, barely able to s sort of satisfy those requirements rather than uh, people coming from abroad. But we, ha we do have mechanisms to raise funds for companies from abroad. Currently, uh, we don't have plans to go out and open up offices in, say, uh, uh, in uh, Germany. Or, but today, uh, we have collaborated with many exchanges in the world. So uh, BRICS countries exchanges, that is Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, we list each other's indices. So my index called Sensex, it trades in ha Hong Kong, and uh, it trades in Sao Paulo, it trades in Moscow, and so on and so on. And their indices trade on us. Similarly, uh, Deutsche Börse actually owns 5% in BSE, and we use that technology, and we also give uh, sort of, we have plans to give them some technology. Similarly, S&P, has a joint venture with us to uh, trade and market our indices across the globe. And so it's, a, it's, it's basically not about opening BSC everywhere, but kind of collaborating with everyone. But the government is now allowing um, Indian companies that are not listed in the, in the stock market in India to raise capital abroad. And that's that why is a, That is just a measure to stop the decline of the rupee. Not at all, not at all. See, Indian companies need funds, right? And India, if it needs to grow at the pace it wants to grow, its own uh, funds, that is the savings rate, is around 35% of GDP, which is very, very high compared to the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. But it's not sufficient. We need to attract funds from outside. And if Indian exchanges are able to get only so much, and the companies require much more, whether to work in India or abroad, they should be going out and getting the funds. So it's nothing to do with, see, we can, once an activity happens, we try to sort of impose everything onto that. It may not be true, but for me, it's still the correct way to do it if people want to raise money abroad. For example, many IT companies in India wouldn't get a good valuation in India itself. In India. Yeah. Uh, I think Make My Trip was a case in point. Uh, MakeMyTrip.com uh, got listed uh, in um, New York at a humongously high valuation. It would not have been even 10% of that valuation if it had listed in India. So in some sense, it's about which company gets which valuation and they would like to go there and I. I, as an exchange, as a regulator, wouldn't like to stop them from making wealth for themselves and for the country. But it stops them listing on your exchange and making right. it bigger. Which is all right. <laughs> I mean, it would have been license permit value if I had stopped them. <laughs> David, I'm going to turn to you now again. So, in your experience, you said, I've been at the Tata for eight months. Um, you, uh, you joined an Indian group. What made you join the Tata's? Uh, how global is it really in terms of its culture? And uh, do you think that's a, that the Tatas have created from a quintessential Indian, what we used to call a family business house, have they created a global culture within the company, within the companies of the group? Yeah, thank you. Um, why did I join? Well, um, I think it's quite interesting. I mean, you're talking about a global culture. Um, you don't necessarily mean an Anglo-Saxon culture. There's no reason why... No. Um, a, a, a great global company um, should necessarily have an Anglo-Saxon culture. Um, why did I join? Well, I think one reason I joined was because um, and I, one of the characteristics, I think, of the company which is absolutely essential, and I think is a bit of a key to its success, is its long-termism. And there's a big debate, uh, certainly in the UK at the moment, about short-termism in business culture. Are there things that can be done? 
uh, legally in terms of regulation on stock exchanges and so on to moderate that. Well, very clearly, um, I mean, our, um, as, as, as Tata's, our aim is, is, is long-term value creation, long-term value creation indeed for a range of stakeholders, uh, not just the shareholders, customers, the employees and the community. And I think, again, uh, the emphasis on the community uh, is helpful when you're globalising into parts of the world where um, corporate social responsibility uh, is now expected. Uh, for us, it's not an add-in. It's, it, it's been very much part of the culture. But I think that long-termism um, right. is very important. And I think it's a kind of global strength um, that we sh or it is, a, it is a strength which should, should become more of a global strength. And I think the, um, how, we, how we achieve what we do is partly because of that confidence. I mean, look at, um, at Corus Steel, for example. Look at the investment that goes into Corus Steel. Uh, would that be happening if you took a short-term uh, approach? Would, would a company with a short-term vision be doing that? No, of course it wouldn't. Um, and I think the, the, the relationship between the Tata Group and its companies, uh, a great number of our bigger companies are listed, of course, on the, on the Bombay Stock Exchange. Uh, Tata uh, Sons itself, our promoter company, is privately owned, two-thirds of it owned by our charitable trusts. And there's that kind of creative distance between uh, the, 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 the centre and the companies. Uh, we call it leadership with trust. But it's that, central, um, it's that essential gap that lets the companies get on with what they're doing. And I think this is quite important for globalisation because yeah. if you've got different business cultures uh, and you as, uh, 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 as Tata from India want to take on uh, Jaguar Land Rover and make a success of it, it's probably quite a good idea to have that creative gap to let the guys who know what they're doing Do with a British brand uh, make it a better British brand um, while you're offering the, 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 the support uh, and the, the, the mentoring, or whatever you like to call it, but from that distance. So I think there's, a, there's some lessons there. It strikes me uh, as, a, as, a, as a Brit working for an Indian company um, that you know, going global doesn't have to mean going Anglo-Saxon. Um, you have to, to look at where your strengths lie uh, and see how you can uh, make the most out of what you're doing in, in different uh, parts of the world.